just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way Good morning, Crossroads. Thank you for joining us today. And we are thankful during this week of Thanksgiving that you are carving out this time to worship with us, to spend this time together, even though we're separate. But we're thankful that you are a part of Crossroads and you're making this an important part of your week. And with Thanksgiving this week, we do pray that as you gather with family and friends, that it's a great time, a safe time, a healthy time for all of you. And as you're watching today, you'll notice that Brad will be presenting the last sermon in the series from the book of Ecclesiastes. So uh, open your Bibles to that and be ready for that time. And we always ask you to do this, but it is important that you like this video, that you share a comment with us, just inter interact with us back and forth throughout the service. Share this also with your family and friends so that more and more people can worship with you, worship with us here at Crossroads Christian Church. So um, don't also do not forget a time of communion that will be coming up later in the service as well. And we'll be joining that service live in just a few moments. So uh, thank you again for being with us, worshiping with us, and let's just begin our time with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your love, for your mercy, for all that you do for us and for our families. Thank you for watching over us. We're praying for those that are being affected by the COVID virus, uh, those individuals and those families. We're praying for their health, for their healing. We're praying that each and every one of us would take whatever steps are necessary to stay safe and healthy. 
But now, Father, help us to just put aside all the cares and concerns of this world and let us focus on you, your word, this time together with the Holy Spirit as he is leading us in spirit and in truth as we worship you. Father, we glorify you. We thank you for all that you do for us, all that you provide for us. And we recognize that it all comes from your hand because you are a generous, loving God. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great time of worshiping this morning. Let's stand and worship this morning. Let's bring out some oldies. You are the Lord, the famous one, famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare. The morning star is shining through, and every eye is watching you. Amen. Revealed by nature and miracles. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. Because you are the Lord, you are the Lord, the famous one, famous one, great is your name in all the earth. All right, the heavens declare, the heavens declare your glory.
done that one in a long time, right? <laughs> I'll tell you, it's just so much fun to do some of the old ones once in a while. I'll tell you, we're going to do a greeting time. Stay where you are. Social distance. I want everybody to turn around and greet one another with a homecoming wave. And if you've never been to homecoming, you're really missing out now. So <laughs> well, let's continue to worship. Since we were doing some older ones, I thought, well, let's just, let's really do some old ones then. And Kind of bring these out. You got to remember this one. Let's sing it together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Come on, sing it out. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Come on now. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. We sing holy, holy, holy. All right, let's open our eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Oh, Lord, come on. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy. Sing holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Father. Sing it together. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Just worship it. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. Let's pray that today. Come on now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Thank you, Father. Lord, that the words that you have for us today get through our ears and into the heart. Open our eyes, Lord, that everything that we see and do and sing today would be to our hearts. Thank you, Father. We just give you all the glory for your mercy. And you saw my steps. You saw my steps. You filled my fear. My cries, you caught my tears. Arms 
arms open wide you ran to me with your mercy Let's sing it out your mercy your mercy your mercy I stand before my king and bow my heart to sing you say about his loving kindness. Your loving kindness leads me to for you just for a moment. Let the words of this song sink in and your loving kindness lead us to a repentance, Lord. Father, we just want to give it all to you today. This is the place where we can come and lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross. And Father, just be in a place where we can worship you and you can minister to us. Where we just want our hearts to be true. Father, we just love you. We just give you all the glory. And we praise you. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. So, Thanksgiving week. Uh, yeah, it's here. How many of you, your Thanksgiving week is looking different this week than in most years in recent memory? Yeah. Yeah, same, same here. Um, and I would assume there were hands um, in people's homes that are watching this online, hands that went up there, but the majority of people in here raised their hands. And, and this, this whole year has kind of been a bummer of year. It's been uh, a really rough year for some um, who have had uh, sicknesses uh, within their family. I'm saying even outside of the coronavirus um, and deaths. And I mean, we've had a couple of very, very uh, important members in our family, uh, each side, that have died this year. And, and, uh, um, going through that whole experience and the hospitalizations that led up to, to that and everything. Just everything was different. You just couldn't see people when you needed to be seeing them and, and all of that. And uh, so it's been, it's been a real bummer of a year in many regards. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't be thankful because the thing is, as long as God is a part of the equation, we certainly have something to be thankful for, right? Right. You know, something that uh, goes way beyond any of 
what this life might dish out to us. And, and so we have good reason to be thankful, even in the middle of everything that's happening. Well, we are ready for the fourth and final message in our series, Chasing the Wind. And uh, uh, so this is it, the final message in the series. And I figure that the best place to begin is at the conclusion, the end not just in regards to uh, the series, but in regards to this particular message. Let's start with the very end of the message first. As you recall, Solomon has been on a quest, uh, and that's what Ecclesiastes is all about. He's been looking for meaning. He's been looking for contentment, satisfaction, all of that kind of stuff, but uh, he isn't finding it. He's experiencing a lot of frustrations, Along the way, uh, you might remember in the very first message of this series, I talked about um, chasing whirlwinds when I was a little kid, like second or third grade, Um, because I I just thought, man, if I could ever catch one, that would be fun. And uh, and that one time uh, when I was that young, I actually did catch one and went into it, ran into it with a great big smile on my face. And uh, need I say, I never chased another whirlwind since, you know, because it was anything but a pleasant experience. I was spitting all that grit out of my mouth and it was in my eyes and, and uh, it just didn't deliver what I had thought that it was going to deliver. Well, that's kind of along the lines of what Solomon is discovering. All of these things that he's chasing after, he knows they hold lots of promise, and this is what he's been looking for. And then once he uh, steps into it, he realizes how hollow it is and that it really isn't able to deliver uh, the fulfillment and the happiness that he was looking for. Now, on top of that, okay, I want to share something that I haven't talked about in the series But this is part of the reason why I wanted you to read through the book of Ecclesiastes because you're going to see certain things that we just don't have time to include in our series. Uh, But one of the things additionally that is really bugging Solomon are the injustices that he's seeing in the world around him. And that's just kind of adding to it all. And I'm not talking about injustice in, in the form that comes from criminals and people breaking the law and, and all of that kind of stuff. No, I'm talking about the kind of injustices that as soon as I reference it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, those kind. Here he says something about it in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. He says, I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race, and the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy, and those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance. By being in the right place at the right time, people can never predict when hard times might come, like fish in a net or birds in a trap. People are caught by sudden tragedy. So in this particular portion of his writing, he's talking about something beyond what seems to be the main theme throughout Ecclesiastes. He's just saying that it it is really frustrating when you stop and you think how things can be so random and they can just happen by chance. Let me give you, he gives a couple of illustrations here, but let me give you an an illustration or two that that, uh, may click as well or maybe even a little bit more so. Think about the person, and probably someone's face and name will come to mind with this. Think about the person who has been very diligent for so many years in their life, getting all the exercise that they know they need to have, watching their diet strictly because, you know, they don't want to get heart disease and all of this kind of stuff. They want to live a long life. Okay, you picturing the person, you know, that is very careful and really going out of their way and being very disciplined. But then, say, in the early 50s, they're in a major car wreck and they end up a quadriplegic. That's the kind of thing I think Solomon is referencing here. 
He's saying that even people that you would think that should live a long, full life because they paid their dues and, and they've set themselves up to be able to live a long, full, healthy life and then all of a sudden something tragic like that happens and the rug gets pulled right out from underneath them. You know, or maybe another example would be um, someone who has uh, done their homework, literally, you know, they've studied, they've gotten whatever education and degrees that they need, and then maybe even another one on top of that in order to be able to be the best in their field as far as the most knowledgeable in whatever field it is that they've studied in. And then they come to a point in time when in their career they should really be, you know, hitting their prime, and they have a stroke. And as a result, they have physical and mental limitations for the rest of their life. See, those are the kind of injustices that I think that Solomon is referencing here in Ecclesiastes 9. So not only is he dealing with all the frustration of every time he sees something that's promising and that's going to bring him happiness and fulfillment in life, you know, meaning in life, and he ends up finding out <clears throat> that was a dead end, that was hollow, it didn't deliver. Not only is he talking about that kind of stuff in the book, but he's referencing stuff like this. You pile this on top of it all, and life really gets frustrating. So, after investing much time in trying to find meaning in life, where does he end up? And that's where I want to start things off. The conclusion of the matter. And I have that in quotes because that is a direct quote from a verse in the book of Ecclesiastes. And here is the verse. It's the second to the last verse in the entire book. It says this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. The conclusion. Anytime you find a statement in a book of the Bible that explains what the message is all about and what the conclusion is that it was driving toward, you really need to key in on that, especially a book like this. There's another place in the Bible. You go over into the Gospels, in the Gospel of John. There's actually 21 chapters in John, but at the very tail end of chapter 20, John makes this statement. These are written, the things that he's been talking about, including, if you look in verse 30, the miracles and all that he, he recorded down. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life. In his name. See, John, he just declares it. This is the reason I've written my gospel. So that you might have faith. And as a result, you might have life. Life eternal. Okay, so, I mean, that, that's very helpful to know, okay, the, the writer of it, this was their purpose. This is what they were driving toward. And, and there can be no argument about it because he states as much. Well, that's what we're seeing in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon is, is making that kind of a statement in this verse, verse 13 of chapter 12. It helps to have a book in the Bible, especially a book like Ecclesiastes that can be kind of confusing at times. It, it helps to have it flat out tell us, this is why I've written all of this. This is why all of this has been recorded. And I want you to notice something. Maybe you noticed it the first time I read this when it was on the screen. The word duty has brackets on it. Have you noticed that? And a lot of times I'll go ahead and remove those, you know, when, when uh, we're creating the PowerPoint. But this time I thought, well, you know, we'll leave this as a teaching point in case you aren't aware of this, why some translations of the Bible have brackets like that. There's a section in your Bible that sometimes is only two or three pages long. It's at the very beginning, right after the table of contents in the introduction or the preface or somewhere right in that neighborhood. It's that part that is even in a smaller print, okay? And it's the part that most of us never read. But what it does is it sheds some light on, 
you know, what we're going to see in all the pages of Scripture, you know, as far as the translators and their work. And it's actually quite helpful to know some of the, the rules that they were working under. Those brackets communicate something. It communicates that that particular word in the Hebrew of the original statement is not there. This was added by the translators. They added it because they felt like it, fill, it, it kind of filled the comment, uh, the expression, a little fuller for our understanding. Literally, the way the Hebrew wor is worded, it says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. That's the way it literally reads. But the translators said, well, let's put the word duty in there. And you'll actually see the word duty in a lot of different translations. But the word isn't actually there. And for me, personally, you know, in understanding that, it's beneficial for me because it makes sense without the word duty. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. I mean, that expression would kind of communicate, this is what it's all about. This is what our lives are all about. This is what being human beings is all about. This right here. So anyway, just a little bit of insight that maybe you weren't aware of, you know, in the past when you've, you've read uh, in the scripture. Now, the message is a paraphrase. Okay, the Living Bible, the message, I use those from time to time. But they are paraphrases. They're the result of one man's work. So you don't want to develop um, doctrinal views based on a paraphrase. Okay? But I really like the way the message reads um, at the very end of Ecclesiastes. It says this. The last and final word is this. Fear God. Do what he tells you. And that's it. <laughs> and it's like, man, that's spot on. That is the point that, that uh, Solomon is making at the very end of all of this. And, and basically his point is that any other approach in trying to find meaning and purpose in life is going to come up short. That's the point that Solomon is making. I mean, he had it all, right? Well, actually, he didn't have it all. He didn't have purpose. He didn't have meaning. He didn't have fulfillment. But as far as stacking up life's experiences, he had it all. As far as accumulating possessions, he had it all, you know, in that regards. But he still didn't have fulfillment, you know, after spending all those years, you know, in this quest. The closer you look, the more you can see the source of his error. During so much of his search, he was drawing the wrong conclusions because his whole orientation was off. Um, since he keeps coming up empty, he concludes that there's a problem. But his thinking is there's a problem in the world or there's a problem with God. You know, I mentioned in one of the previous messages that even though his search is under the sun, he's kind of leaving God out of the equation, yet not entirely, because there's like three dozen references to God scattered throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. But, uh, you know, some of those times, you know, when he's referencing, it's kind of like he's pointing a finger at God. You know, it's like there's a problem. There's a problem with this world. There's, there's a problem that may, maybe it's because of God. Um, but the reality of the matter is the problem isn't out there. The problem was right here the whole time. The problem was with Solomon, but he didn't see it. Max Lucado began one of his books, uh, and you've probably read some of Max Lucado's writings. Um, he began one of his books with this statement, blame it on Copernicus. And uh, if you don't know, uh, Copernicus was a guy back in the 16th century right around 1540, somewhere in that time, um, who appeared on the scene, and he was trying to convince people that the earth was not the center of the universe. And that was not a very popular thing to be trying to impress upon people, because that is not what people believed. They believed that the earth was the center. But uh, Copernicus kept trying to say, no, it's not. 
And so people just kind of turned a deaf ear to him and tried to ignore him as much as they could. Problem was that after Copernicus, there was another guy that we recognize the name of even more. A few decades later, a guy by the name of Galileo appeared on the scene. And Galileo's message was every bit as strong as Copernicus, is that the earth is not the center of everything. In fact, Galileo made it very clear, and Copernicus may have touched on this, but Galileo made it very clear that even our own solar system, the earth is not the center of. The sun is the center of our solar system. And people did not like the sound of that to the point that Galileo ended up spending time in prison. (laughs) They imprisoned him for teaching such nonsense, which in reality was actually true. But you see, people in general, um, they aren't receptive to the idea of being told that we're not the center of things, that things don't all revolve around us. But yet, that's pretty much where Solomon had to get in his thinking. He wasn't there for who knows how many years. It may have even been a few decades that he struggled in this quest to try to find meaning in life. But eventually, based on what we're reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it seems like Solomon eventually got there. That he began to understand that he wasn't the center of it all. That people in general are not the center of it all. And that's why we see that verse. It says, now that all has been heard, you know, all talk, all arguments, everything has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter, the conclusion of the search that he's invested years to. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole of man. Fear God, I believe, is the central statement that he's making there. Now, I know he says, and keep his commandments, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. I'm not trying to make light of that part of it. Uh, You'll understand why here in a few minutes. Uh, but But I think the central thought that he's trying to communicate here is that this this is really where it's all at. It's fearing God. To understand life's meaning, you've got to look beyond yourself because the universe does not revolve around you it revolves around God look at how the chapter began because he's kind of ramping up to making that statement in chapter 12 verse 1 he says so remember your creator in the days of your youth it's kind of interesting because I said there's been like a three dozen times that God is referenced in the book but this is the only time that uh, he's referenced as being the creator. Why, why didn't Solomon just say, remember your Lord, remember the Lord God, remember the Most High, remember the Holy One? Why didn't he say any of those phrases? Instead, he specifically chooses the word creator. Why does he do that? Well, I think it has a whole lot to do with once we remember that we have a creator then you can't help but remember you are the creature and I am the creature. I am the created. I'm not the creator, meaning I'm not supreme. There is one above me, the one who created me. And people forget that. They forget that far too often. And when they do forget that, you know, it's much easier to open the door to pride. And when pride rules the day, well, you know, then you're going to have a whole string of problems there. To fear God doesn't mean that you're terrified of God. Sometimes people jump to the conclusion that well, when a verse in the Bible says something about fearing God, it's talking about shaking and trembling and, and jumping whenever God's name is mentioned, like he's, he's uh, going to be the one that's going to squeeze all the fun out of your life or whatever. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of the way people think of it when they think about fearing God. But that's, that's not really what that phrase means it means that you have a deep sense of awe and reverence for God and that is a good thing as a matter of fact that phrase is used well over a hundred times in the Bible Old Testament and New in fact if you're adding them up it's right close to 150 times scattered throughout the Bible 
to fear God is found, and it's found in a positive sense. Here's one of the examples, because Proverbs, you know, for those that have read all the way through the Bible, you, you know Proverbs touches on this multiple times. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so basically what is being said there is that, is that when this begins to develop in your life, this fear of the Lord, you're beginning to understand. You're beginning to see. You're starting to see 2020. You're, you're starting to develop, you know, an accurate picture of everything. And that's why it says that way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I did a study um, some time back where, you know, and, and I could have, you know, pulled several articles that were written about the fear of God and people's conclusions and stuff like that. But I thought, you know what, before I start reading their articles, I, I want to just kind of do this myself, my own study. I invested several hours into it where I read, you know, and just reflected on all 150 verses in the Bible that reference the fear of the Lord. And, and, and I began to discover something that, that in these verses, um, you, don't, you don't have to make assumptions as to what the fear of the Lord looks like because the scripture tells you what it looks like. You know, I ended up developing a list of seven or eight characteristics that are true in a person's life who is actually fearing the Lord. Now, some of those didn't appear as frequently as other ones. And so what I want to do is I want to show you the ones that appeared the most often, okay? So I'm going to share with you three tests for the fear of the Lord, that whether it was embedded right within the verse that used that phrase, the fear of the Lord, or if there wasn't a, um, something found right in the verse, then I read the verse before it or the verse after to see if that needed to help complete the thought of what was being expressed. And sometimes that's the verse that shed light. But so many times, it was the very verse itself. Okay, there's a few more uh, phrases or characteristics of a person who fears the Lord, but these are the ones that appeared most often, and I would encourage you to use these to examine your own life, your own heart. Number one, are you shunning evil? Okay, remember, we're defining what fear in the Lord uh, is all about. Are you shunning evil? I've included on your outline several references, but that is certainly far from being an exhaustive list. It's kind of a starter list for you um, if you want to look into this a little bit further. But here's, here's one of them. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. There you go. It doesn't state it much more succinctly than that. This is what fear in the Lord is. It's to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride evil conduct, and perverse speech. One of the classic examples in the Bible of someone who feared the Lord is a, a character that, that you know well. Uh, his name was Job. And Job is described in Job chapter 1, verse 1, as a man who feared God. Let's see if there's any additional insight that we can see in that verse. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. There you go. Now, if there were only these two verses, okay, you know, it still would be a teaching point, but, you know, I wouldn't be quite as emphatic about it. But the reality of the matter is, there is far from only being two verses that link together the idea of fear in the Lord and shunning evil, avoiding evil, running from evil. If you're looking for another word that maybe encapsulate the concept here, think of the word repentance, because that's kind of what we're talking about here. Turning away from evil and going the other direction. Turning away from sin and going the other direction. Not embracing sin, not cherishing sin, just the opposite, going the other direction. That's, that's kind of the concept that's being expressed. All right, so here's another characteristic about fearing God. Are you obeying God? Now, obviously, one of the examples for this is our verse in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, because it states it right there. 
But again, it's not the only one. I gave Job as the classic example of point number one. Let me give another individual here as the example for point number two, a fellow by the name of Abraham. You ever hear of Abraham? Yeah, and we'll talk more about Abraham in two Sundays, but, uh, um, and even this particular incident in a couple of weeks. But let me just tell you enough to drive home the point here. You remember Abraham was given a promise that he and Sarah would um, have a child. From their seed, their descendants would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. You remember how old Abraham was when he was given that promise? Okay, he was the age of some that are in this room now, right? I mean, like 75. But when was he when he and Sarah had Isaac? 100. 25 years later. Okay, so a few years roll by following that. We don't know exactly how old Isaac is. Uh, some scholars suggest that he was an adolescent, about 13, 14, 15 years old. I'm not sure exactly what all they're using to conclude that, uh, but it's as good of a guess as any, I suppose. Uh, so let's say he was an adolescent, and the Lord speaks to Abraham again at this particular point in time. Now, at this point, they still have Isaac, okay? That's your descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky. We got Isaac, all right? We got one child. And, uh, but then the Lord speaks to Abraham and says, take your son, your only son, that's specifically as stated, and go to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Okay, now that couldn't have made a whole lot of sense to Abraham. Because all of his hopes, as far as the promise of God, are, are in this boy. But now God has given him instruction to go to Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. And, and the whole story is found in Genesis chapter 22. And so Abraham does it. He heads out early the next morning, and, and when they start getting close, he leaves some of their uh, traveling companions behind and just him and Isaac hoof it on up. Uh, the mountain, and they're, they're carrying the wood, they're carrying the fire, they're carrying the knife. They got all this. But his son, Isaac, asks him uh, as they're go- scaling the mountain, he's saying, um, okay, we got all this stuff, but where is the sacrifice? And then that's when Abraham says, the Lord will provide. Um, what was going through Abraham's mind at that moment? moment? I don't really know. But uh, he was just trusting, trusting that God was going to provide. They get up to the spot where the sacrifice is going to be made. They build an altar. Um, Isaac is tied up and he's laid on the altar. Abraham pulls the knife out. If you can imagine being at this point in carrying out the command that had been given to him. He pulls out the knife and it's at that time the Lord speaks. What did the Lord say? Well, you off the top of your head might be able to summarize it as I can. But let's not settle for a summary. Let's look. Here's what it said. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. And of course, then there ends up being a ram caught in the thicket. And the Lord did provide, you know, what was sacrificed. But notice right in the center of that verse... Now I know that you fear me. What? What just happened? Obedience. He was obedient. Even though it totally didn't add up in his mind, Abraham was being obedient to God. And this is a characteristic of fearing God, is that you're obedient. And it's a little wonder that Solomon said what he did in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Okay, well, let's move on to the third characteristic that just kept coming up time after time after time as I was reading all of these passages that talk about fearing the Lord. And it, I'm framing it in a question. Are you serving God? And again, there's plenty of scriptures that we could look at that reference that. Here is one that is very much to the point. In fact, it's a good one to memorize. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 says, But be sure 
to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he's done for you. In other words, in view of everything that God has done for you, isn't this what you and I ought to do? Is to fear the Lord and serve him. It links those up, those two thoughts, hand in hand. You know, there is a uh, um, passage of scripture that you are very familiar with, though you may not remember what chapter and verse it is in and who said it originally. Um, But this is the kind of stuff that I see on people's refrigerators. I see it on cross-stitch wall decorations and stuff like that. You know, where it says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You familiar with that? That whole verse reads like this. And and what I'm reading is Joshua 24, verse 15. It says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Who said that? It was Joshua. He was an old man. In fact, he was about ready to die. He was at the end of his life, but he was sharing this and challenging people, you know, as, as, as far as serving God is concerned. What I want you to see this morning is the verse that set up that, that verse that is so well remembered. Let's look at the preceding verse. Joshua 24, verse 14. So, fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River in in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. And so what we remember and what we cross-stitch and paint or whatever, you know, is as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Well, what set all that up is Joshua saying, fear the Lord. That's the main point that he's getting across. But one of the ways that the fear of the Lord expresses itself is in serving the Lord. So he's not just talking about jumping through a few hoops and, and you know, volunteering on occasion for this or for that. Ultimately, what he's talking about here is fearing the Lord and letting that be part of the drumbeat of your life. So I, I would encourage you to kind of allow that, use that as, as like a devotional. This week I gave you additional verses that are on your outline, but in kind of a prayerful way, look back through those, read the various verses, make it a matter of prayer that God will help reveal to you, open your eyes so that you can see what he sees, whether those Um, characteristics are a part of your life or if they're not a part of your life. But that's why it's a devotional. Make it a a part of, Lord, I want to be in the center of your will. And so I know these things need to be a big part of my life because uh, this is the end of the matter. This is the whole of man. This is what it's all about, is that this kind of stuff is happening in my life because of my relationship to you, because because I truly do live in awe of who you are as my creators, my creator. So again, this is why we see at the very end of Ecclesiastes, the final two verses saying, now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. Now, before I conclude the series and conclude today's message, why did I title the message like this? Why did I give it this title? Why did I wait so long? I gave it that title because I believe um, wholeheartedly. In fact, I would say I am confident that this is what Solomon was asking himself while he was kicking himself. After investing all these years of time, perhaps even decades, you know, we're not, it's not specifically spelled out for us how long he was on this quest. But I think after all of that time, 
I think he was kicking himself because he had it modeled for him from his dad, David. You know, what a life fearing the Lord is like. Not that David was a perfect man. I mean, you and I both know David wasn't a perfect man, but David was a man that loved the Lord. He feared the Lord. And in so much of his, his life, he was so devoted to living for the Lord. And so Solomon was able to see that. And, and actually, initially, in the early days, Solomon got started off in the right foot, but that, didn't, uh, that wasn't sustained. And, and Solomon ended up spending years of time chasing the wind, coming up empty. Why? You know, why, when his dad had set the example that he set and all of this? Well, I think there can be multiple answers to that. One, due to the influence of his wives. You know, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or something saying that. We looked at the passage of Scripture in one of the early messages that Solomon married a bunch of women, and the Bible flat out tells about their influence on him, and it was not good. And so I think that certainly plays into the answer as to why um, Solomon got off track so bad and perhaps stayed off track for so long. But I don't know if that's the complete answer. I mean, pride, I think pride very well, you know, played a part in all of this as well. I mean, once you have, you know, some of the achievements that are described in Ecclesiastes that he achieved, once you become as wealthy as he does. He, in fact, he was so wealthy, you remember the verse that talked about how um, silver was as commonplace as stones in his day. Silver had no value. That's how wealthy Solomon was. And, you know, once you have those achievements and, and you become, you know, that wealthy and everything, uh, it, it's, it's fairly easy uh, if you put your guard down for pride to slip in and cause you to start thinking that, that you're the boss of your own life, you're the captain of your own ship, you're the one that's calling the shots, and boy, what a, what a good job I've done in my life. You know, so it very well could have been pride. Uh, that, that found a home in his heart um, and ruled the day or ruled the years. May, maybe, though, there's another thing. Maybe he was living week after week, month after month, year after year, under the delusion of thinking that he was this close to finding true happiness, this close to finding fulfillment. Okay, it wasn't in that, and it wasn't in that. But boy, this here looks awful promising. If I could just do that, if I could just acquire that. Oh, well, that wasn't what I thought. But you know, I read somewhere that if I go over there, then maybe that will give me what I'm looking for. And maybe he was living under that delusion and just going from one thing to another. But what we do know is he spent a lot of time in this quest. And uh, the way chapter 12... Um, opens up, also seems to drive that home that he spent a lot of time because, oops, I thought I had a slide for it. Um, in chapter 12, I showed you this verse earlier. I guess that's what I was thinking of. Verse 1, it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. But apparently Solomon got off track from that. And Solomon, in kind of a tongue-in-cheek sort of a way, he starts exper expressing what the days of trouble that are going to come when you're not a youth anymore, what they look like. You remember this passage? He says, um, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark. What's that a reference to? He's losing his eyesight. He's getting old. He's losing his eyesight. He says, when the keepers of the house tremble. Well, and I'm just looking at Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The keepers of the house tremble. What's he talking about there? Yeah, he's talking about the hands and the shaking. And the strong men stoop. Getting a little more bent over as the years roll by. When the grinders cease because they are few. Teeth, that's right. I mean, any research I've done, I don't think they had implants back in those days. So, uh, yeah, losing teeth. And those looking through the windows grow dim. Okay, again, perhaps something about eyesight. 
And the doors to the street are closed, and the sound of grinding fades. It's talking about hearing, starting to lose your hearing. When men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. One of the characteristics of when you get older that I really haven't appreciated that much until really it's been this last year um, is the whole idea of laying down and getting a full night's sleep. Man, you really appreciate it when that happens. (laughs) Because I'm finding three or four days a week, I'm waking up at 3 or 3.30, no matter how tired I was when I went to bed, and I just can't sleep anymore. And, uh, yeah, I think that's what that's talking about. Men rise up at the sound of birds. You know, it's like, oh, they heard something, but then when they investigate it, all their songs grow faint. So there really wasn't a sound after all. When men are afraid of heights and of the dangers in the streets, getting afraid of heights. One of the things that you don't see with uh, the, um, and you shouldn't see, with those that get, you know, up there in years is climbing to the top of a 12-foot ladder. They have no business being up there, right? I mean, when you're younger, you know, you go up something like that and you fall, okay, you're going to hurt tomorrow. There's, that's going to leave a bruise sort of thing. But the older you get, it's like it'll break you, you know, uh, if, if uh, you f- fall. And then it says, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along. Gray hair, you're moving a whole lot slower than you used to. So it's almost like a tongue-in-cheek sort of way that he's referencing, but he is. He's describing old age here, but the whole point that he made that launched him into all of that is he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now that's ramping up to saying this is the whole duty of man, to fear God and to keep his commands. That's where he's headed with all of this. But he's saying while you're young, while you're young, Make sure you keep your focus. You know, before all this stuff happens, don't wait until you're an old man or an old woman. You know, this phrase, why did I wait so long? You know, honestly, part of the reason that that phrase is in my mind is because I have heard that phrase dozens and dozens of times over the years from people that are senior citizens. I still remember the very first time I ever heard a statement like that as a believer. It was from a woman that uh, I affectionately called Aunt Catherine. She was no relative of mine, though. She was the great aunt of my neighbors. And my family and my neighbor's family, we were really tight. Our dads were like best friends. They, you know, we'd play horseshoes and have fish fries together. They had a a pond that we'd go fishing or swimming in all the time. And, and, uh, you know, whenever they were shearing sheep, my older brother and I, we were in the middle of that. Whenever uh, we had the opportunity uh, to run over the hill uh, and help milk cows, we did that as well with them. And needless to say, when it came to putting up hay, we put up hay with them. And whenever we put up hay, one of the primary places that it was stored was this great big barn on Aunt Catherine's property. Aunt Catherine, back when I was like in junior high, she was in her mid-80s. And she was all bent over, and, uh, um, and, and she was an old farmer's wife. She was all bent over, and she didn't have a cane. She had a board you know, a board that was like that long, and she used that board to walk around. And when you would come up to her and talk to her, because whenever we pulled in, putting hay in the barn, she would, in a very slow fashion, make her way out there to the barn. And, and you know, you'd stand there and try to talk to her. And, you know, I mean, she's way down here. And she would try to bend her knees to look up. And the best thing was just find a place to sit down. And then you can kind of look eye to eye. And uh, like I said, she was a great aunt of their family, but she kind of became my great aunt and my brother's great aunt as well. And uh, after um, I uh, finished high school, I had uh, given my life to Christ, and I went to Bible college. And Once I graduated, I 
moved to Illinois and was serving in a church there. It only been there a couple years. Um, on one of those weeks, it probably was like a Thanksgiving week or a Christmas week, my family uh, came back here to Kansas to uh, enjoy the holiday with, with uh, uh, our families. And, and I came earlier than what I normally did, and so I swung by a nursing home in Rossville, Kansas. My mom worked there. She was a cook. And uh, so I waited till all the food was served and everything, and I was standing up against the wall right by the serving window, and I tried to surprise her by just popping around saying, hey, you know, and she knew I was coming later in the day. And she was happy to see me, and her very first immediate knee-jerk reaction was, hey, let me fill a plate for you. What do you want? And I looked down at the bowl of this and the bowl of that and the bowl of that, all of which had to be eaten with a spoon. And uh, I was just like, I, th- I think I'll grab something on the way to the house. You know, I didn't want any of that. And I told her I just came to see her. And she goes, oh, while you're here, Brad, you need to go see Aunt Catherine. I was like, whoa, I hadn't thought of Aunt Catherine in a few years. And she said, yeah, Aunt Catherine's been admitted here. She's not doing well. She's, she's dying. And, but she would love to see you. And I said, yeah, I want to go see her. And as I turned to start walking away, Mom said, oh, you'll have to speak up because she has hearing aids, but she still can't hear. And so, so I made my way to the room and uh, walked in there, and she was all bent over in her wheelchair and so I got down on my knees in front of her and tried talking, and she, you could tell from her eyes she couldn't see anymore, and, and she could barely hear, and she kept saying, what? And, and by the time she finally was understanding me, I think everybody on that wing was understanding me. <laughs> I was talking so loud. And, uh, um, you know, and, and she, she remembered me, her face lit up, and and, uh, um, and right away she asked, what are you doing with your life? And she's like 95 or something at this point. And what are you doing with your life? And um, I explained to her, I thought, well, here's an open door for sharing a word of faith here to witness to her. And so I shared about giving my life to Christ and um, going to Bible college, and now I was serving the Lord in Illinois and trying to help other people grow in a relationship with the Lord. And while I was sharing that with her, Aunt Catherine started crying. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to describe the condition that I saw she was in, but it was really bad. I had never seen some of what I saw there. And, uh, and so I thought she was in pain or something. And so I said, let me get a nurse and all. And she grabbed my hand and said, that's not why I'm crying. And I said, why are you crying? And, and her comment, and it wasn't verbatim the same as, as that, but her comment was, I wish I had done what you did with your life. I wish when I was young that I had made a decision like that for God. And, uh, you know, and I talked more to her and I prayed with her. And, and uh, but, you know, that was only the first of many times that I heard that from people that I would, was even in this baptistry right here on some of those occasions with someone that was 70 years old that was being baptized saying, I wish I had done this 50 years ago or 60 years ago. I wish I hadn't waited so long. I'm pretty convinced that's what Solomon was thinking. Why did I wait so long? You know, there's a chance that someone here today is Solomon-like or someone that's watching online that you are Solomon-like. You're kind of dabbling in this, you're dabbling in that, and you're, you're trying to find, you know, something. You maybe can't even define what it is that you're trying to find, but you're, you're trying this and that, and you've been looking for something that would provide direction and meaning to your life, but you keep coming up empty. And my encouragement at the conclusion of this series is this, why wait any longer? Because the answer you're looking for is your creator. The one who created you, it is only through him and in him that you can find the meaning that you're looking for in life. Anything else 
will be superficial at best. It will not last. But through our Lord, that is where you will find, because, because that's the whole of man. That's why we were created, to be able to experience what we can find in a relationship with the Lord. So I encourage you to really make that a matter of prayer if, if you've been searching. We're going to have our time of communion uh, right now. And some of you in here, um, maybe it was 50 or 60 years ago that you made a decision for Christ and you've been faithful ever since you can remember as a kid. Use this as a time of, of just celebrating that and whoever it was that influenced you in those early days. But even if it has been of late that you made a decision for Christ, that is still clearly a reason to celebrate. While you take the bread and you drink the cup, which there's some back on the table if you forgot to grab one when you came in, um, help yourself there now. Um, But when you take the bread and the cup, remember the body and the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. for being a God who cares, for being the very one who created us to begin with, gave us life. But when things kind of went south, you didn't abandon us, but you went to great length to provide a way, to provide a Savior, and that is Jesus. And we celebrate your love, Lord, because it makes all the difference in life and in eternity. And we celebrate that today by reflecting on your love as clearly demonstrated in the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's been a good morning to be together with you as we worship together and, and just honor God with our, our obedience and our submission to him. I have a few announcements that I want to share with you this morning before we dismiss. The first one has to do with prime time in December. Uh, I don't know who that guy is, but uh, they invited him to be at prime time on December the 2nd, so since he can't come and be here, I'll stand in his place, okay? So uh, if you're so inclined to show up on that evening for, uh, for that event, we'll begin at 645 on December the 2nd. So that's enough of that. Moving on. Men's breakfast, our fellowship breakfast that meets generally the first Saturday of every month, We'll be meeting next on December the 5th, and we have a guest speaker that will be at that breakfast 
for us on that morning, Scott Lamaster, who is the director of Taking It to the Streets, a, a ministry to the homeless and to the other underprivileged is going to be here to speak. So we encourage uh, guys to, to sign up for that. And if we need to, we'll even meet here in the gym to make sure that we've got some distancing available for us. But so, so keep that in mind, and we encourage guys to sign up for that and plan to be here. Then for the ladies, we've got a women's ministry cookie bake that's going to be held on December the 12th. So ladies, make sure next time you go to uh, the store, you, you buy the, the frozen pre-mixed cookie stuff and it saves you all the work. Right? Uh, or you can buy all of the various ingredients and throw it all together and do that too. But there's information in the bulletin about that. Phil and I have already decided that we're going to be here towards the end of that and we'll be the taste testers for that. But ladies, keep that in mind. And this is for ladies who are 10 years old and up. So it'll be a good time for the girls as well. Would you stand with me? We'll close out our time with this word of prayer. Precious Father, thank you for your love, for your grace. Thank you for this message, all of these messages from the book of Ecclesiastes that just really uh, impress upon us how important it is that we find our purpose, our hope in you and in you alone. Forgive us of those times that we wander off and feel like that we can do it on our own. Help us, Father, to be able to, to fear you, to obey you, to serve you, to give our lives to you so that we can truly be enriched by having you at the heart and the center of our lives. Be with us through this week as we celebrate Thanksgiving in its various forms, and we pray, Father, that you'll keep us safe and healthy but more than anything, that we would keep our eyes on you and praise you for the many blessings that we have in this life and for eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have an awesome week.